it is a pleasure to do this, and it's actually a little bit daunting because I look into the room and I all look like I know most of these people here. So uh, uh, thank you for coming, and uh, I'll um, and don't daunt me too much. Um, I think that the easiest way I, in my mind, corral all the things that are happening in the world economy is to think of them in terms of stories. Uh, and I think there are three stories which are directly relevant to our subject today. And the first, we use this word of globalization. Um, and uh, I think um, Kofi Annan, uh, who, of course, you may have heard speak here uh, uh, what, about 18 months ago, two years ago, uh, has caught it very well in that. Um, the second story is that we've had a pick of a cycle and we are recovering slowly but with huge, huge burdens of debt uh, at every level, not just here in the UK, not just at a government level, uh, not just at a personal level, not just at a financial market level, but everywhere. And I think um, you know, the US, which has scrambled through this whole thing rather better than most of us, still has uh, uh, the huge problem uh, uh, of public debt. And the third story, which is relevant to us is not so much a global one, but a regional one, which is how is Europe going to re-engineer itself? What, what can we do in Europe that, that's better than other people? We will be less important in the world. I think that is inevitable, and I'll try and demonstrate that a little bit later. But uh, uh, we, we can't uh, really go on like this. Uh, uh, and how do we preserve our nice life with these levels of uh, welfare spending that we've got? And Angela Merkel's famous uh, uh, thing is, um, is up there. Uh, let me give you the presentation structure. Um, what I'm going to do is, first of all, I want to give you a long historical perspective. How do we see the rise of the BRICS in, in a long, you know, several hundred year a uh, thousand year perspective, uh, because I think it's actually, actually quite fascinating. We'll then look at the structural forces changing the world, we'll then look at the cycle, and then I thought I'd show you some brick graphs, uh, which I've derived from the Goldman Sachs work. And then there are questions that we might like to consider for the rest of the day. This moment in history, for the 18 out of the past 20 centuries, Asia has accounted for more than half the world economy. Uh, I don't know whether you've heard of the wonderful man called Angus Madison, um, who is uh, an economic historian who died uh, four years ago, um, spent his life trying to chart the size of the, of the economy at various stages of its history. And... Um, uh, one of these conclusions, did you know, for example, that uh, um, China uh, was the world's largest economy until about 18, 1890, when it was passed by the US? Did you know that um, uh, before 1500, from uh, the time of Christ to 1500, India was the world's largest economy? Indeed, uh, this, is, this is Angus Madison's stats, and you know, they're, they're a bit dodgy, but, but at the time of Christ, India was the largest economy, China about two-thirds of its size, and the Roman Empire about a quarter of its size. So this moment of history, we are in a way reversing the power shift that took place as a result of the Industrial Revolution. We, we got it first. Um, uh, we got these technologies first. We developed it first here in Britain and then in Europe, and we shot ahead. And what we're seeing now in power terms is a reversal of that great leap forward that we made then. And if you took this moment, um, well, you know, G20, G7, um, China passing Japan. I saw a story, and I'm not sure, if you do the calculations at purchasing power parity, uh, China actually passed the US this year, or passes the US this year. I'm not sure I believe that. Um, I, I prefer market exchange rates, but you know, if you're interested in, in living standards, PPP is probably better. 
um, so passing the US now. And, and so that's actually the first piece of serious research I've suggest, that I've seen suggesting this is the moment where China passes the US to become the world's largest economy. The back end is some work by HSBC, which puts it not till the 2040s, but it depends on how you do the numbers. It is going to happen, uh, probably within our lifetime. And then uh, it's a bit of a trick question. Do you know uh, Britain's largest manufacturing employer by employment? The answer is it's Tata of India. Huh. We, we know about China. We don't aware of that. And then, of course, if I'm talking about the other BRICS, I am now uh, uh, writing for the Independent and the London Evening Standard, both of which are owned by Russians, the only significant media empire in the world to be owned by the R of the, of the BRICS. Long may it continue. They're wonderful owners, wonderful owners. <laughs> how, how, can I, how can I say anything else? A graph which from this Angus Madison work. And I've shown these oranges at the, at the same size rather than a proportional size, but it's actually easier to, <laughs> by rights, the world a thousand years ago, the world economy, that's the top right, was much smaller. The one I want to focus on is the orange bit. The orange bit of the orange is Asia. And can you see, utterly dominated the world a thousand, two thousand years ago, and they got smaller, a thousand years ago, smaller and smaller and smaller, until by 1950 it was only 20%. And now it's started to get larger again, and I think it will, within our lifetimes, uh, you know, providing we hang around a bit, we'll actually be back to, to, to half the world economy as it was in 1820. In 1820, this was the global pecking order. I put GDP on some of the slides, and I, I, I put GDP and population. The big population countries were the ones with the big economies. In 1820, the UK, which had the highest GDP of the industrial world per head, had only about three or four times the GDP per head of India. That's why we wanted to take it over and run it. And um, in actual GDP terms, the pecking order was China, India, then the rest of us a long, long way behind. This is the world before the Industrial Revolution really, really cracked on. Um, keep that graph in mind. We'll be seeing something rather similar in a moment's time. Structure. They're not the only structural forces changing the world, but they're the ones I find easiest to think about. And we're going to start with demography. Europe is not only aging fast, but it is with Japan the oldest that our species has ever been. Human beings has never been as old as we in Europe and in Japan are at the moment. We've never had that same age profile. So that inevitably shifts economic power away from us, away to, to, to nations where there is a larger proportion of the working, of a larger proportion of the population working. Um, I think that we also should be aware that this isn't just a, a population change, it'll also be an attitudinal change, that we will want to be interested in the attitudes of the faster growing younger countries. And I suppose the best example I can give of that is the way in which we are now benchmarking our math students against Shanghai and Singapore in the PISA study. That would have been unthinkable again. 10 or 15 years ago, uh, that we would be worried that our, our math students weren't as good uh, as the young, uh, uh, the 16 year olds in, Sing in Shanghai. Very simple graph, proportion of the population over the age of 65 in the G7. Can you see all the lines go up, but they go up at different speeds. Um, the steepest line on that graph is Japan. Um, which was in the 1950s the youngest of the G7, now indubitably the oldest. The least steep line on that graph is the United States, that's the blue line, becoming old, but becoming older more slowly than the rest of us. Um, and so one of the reasons why I think that demography favors the US is simply that it is in G7 terms relatively young. We're middle of the pack in Britain. 
Why did it happen? Because of the collapse of birth rates, uh, which all the developed world was above replacement rate of 2.1 babies per mother in 19, uh, 1960, all fell below. There was not one single significant developed country that did not fall below replacement rate during the course of the 1960s. If you look now, you can see US, France, UK sort of up pretty close to replacement rate with, um, uh, but, but Italy, Germany, and what well, I put Spain on there, all way below it. Um, that's Europe. That's a north-south thing in Europe. And uh, you might say an English-speaking world uh, and uh, 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 a, um, uh, a, a continent, uh, uh, the southern European world. If you look at the global picture, we're all a little cluster down at the bottom there. Look at the top. You've got Niger, Nigeria, Pakistan coming down, but still very, very high. Yeah. Um, Africa's population already much larger than that of Europe, uh, becoming, relatively speaking, uh, much larger. And that gets into questions like, um, you know, is it a strength or a weakness uh, to have uh, so many people? How do you feed them? How do you manage the economy with lots of young people if they don't have jobs? China, which is, where are we? Uh, a red line in the middle, was up among the emerging world pack, is now a developed country one-child policy kicking in. If you look within uh, the developed world, quite different patterns in terms of the size of the working population. And these are projections through to 2050, showing that US, Canada, UK go up, and France, Germany, Italy go down. Um, you've probably seen some projections about how the UK uh, and France will become more populous than Germany in another uh, 20 or so, 20, 30 years' time. Um, this is it's already happening at a working population level as far as uh, Germany and the UK are concerned. If you ask working population among the BRICS, you get another story. And this story, I suppose my message here is that it, it's China now, it'll be India next. Um, this is the proportion of the population uh, uh, of working age um, defined um, as 15 to 60, uh, which is kind of a pretty rum definition, but anyway, it's the way, it's the way this is the way uh, the BRICS model does it. And can you see India, uh, the brown light, going on up? The, India is getting old, but two generations behind China which is the uh, uh, um, black line, which is whizzing down now. China is at a sweet spot at the moment. It won't be forever. Russia, actually, is at a relatively sweet spot at the moment. It won't be forever. What does this mean? Well, I think we need to be very aware that in Europe, facing a, 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 a post-developed uh, post, uh, uh, country dominance world, Europe is different north and south. There are big differences within Europe which will create tensions inevitably within the European Union. Um, but we're all in some difficulty. US, basically much more positive. I made the point about China and, uh, and India. I think that the final point is the interesting one, or the one that interests me most, which is with how do we adapt? How do we, knowing something is going to happen, we really know with very high levels of confidence that this is going to happen, how do we adapt to it? How do we sort out our pensions? We certainly don't do it by dropping our pension age as, uh, as Chairman has just done. This is the wrong thing to do. I think Britain is extremely interesting uh, as an innovative country coping with aging. Um, something like, uh, how, let me guess one right, uh, out of the job, we are, we are creating jobs faster than ever before in our history. We're at a rate of about a million a year at the moment. About more than half of those are self-employed. And out of those self-employed, about 70% of people over the age of 50. So you know, we, we are adapting. Some places are. Greenery. Um, I think we remain a fossil fuel economy. But this is a particular 
problem for Europe because Europe does not have secure energy supplies and it has less, it now realizes quite how insecure some of those supplies are after the events of the past, uh, the past few weeks. Um, I think we have a big problem. Interesting issue, and, and I, people in this room probably know more than I do about it, fracking buys us a bit of time, but maybe, maybe not much. This comes from a BP study showing um, projections of primary energy supply through to 2030. And the point here is that the bottom three blocks there it goes from 1950 to 2030. Bottom three bits are all fossil fuels, coal, oil, gas. At the moment, those three fossil fuels account for about 90% of primary energy production. In 2030, they'll still be over 80%. So these blocks at the bottom dominate. You know, we can build all these windmills, you know, chop up all these birds, uh, but it doesn't actually change the big picture very much. Nuclear doesn't help very much. Helps a bit, but not very much. You still have a tiny multicolored bit at the bottom, at the top, is still quite small relative to the totality. So we remain a fossil fuel economy, I think, for the foreseeable future, or one that is dominated by, by fossil fuels. If it's, a, if it's dominated by fossil fuels, where are they? And power remains with those areas. Uh, and Russia uh, is currently, if you add um, oil and, uh, and gas to get combined, just about the world's largest producer. The US may be passing it this year. If not this year, maybe next. Saudi, you know, big in oil, but you know, not yet really uh, developing its gas. So it's the US and Russia. And I suppose you, my message that I get from this graph is that actually fracking changes the balancing, the power balance between, between uh, uh, China and Russia, uh, between um, uh, uh, Russia and the United States. Did you know that uh, if this is a, a problem for Europe, it's also a problem, of course, for China? And China has just passed, don't have up to date data, probably sometime around the back end of last year, became the largest importer of oil, uh, passing the US. US on the way down, thanks to fracking, thanks to increased production, China on the way up. Big, uh, a further issue in, in power. Conclusions for Europe. Um, well, I put them on this uh, board and I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, I, I think the first and the last are the ones, again, that interest me most, uh, that there is a quick win by being green, as green as you sensibly can. Uh, and if you're running a company, you know, I think it's a, you know, try and do it, do it green a green way. Um, because, you know, why, why damage your reputation among the young by having a reputation for being dirty? Um, and then at the bottom, um, countries that are best at adapting. And um, you'll gather from what I've been saying, my own feeling is that conservation is a thing rather than uh, uh, alternative power. But there's something, something to talk about. Technology. I'm fascinated by the way that technology has both leveled the global playing field, but also enabled pinnacles of excellence to sell their goods and services around the world. And the example I find most thrilling is Bangalore, because Bangalore is, um, what is it, 400 kilometers from the sea at the nearest place in every direction, in north south, you, know, you, can't, you, you can't get to the sea. Until recently, it had a tiny uh, ex-military airport uh, in the middle of town. See, you, how do clever people there export their ideas if you can't put them on a boat and you can't put them on an aircraft. And the answer was, you do it via the satellite. You do it remotely. You do it, shoot it up and shoot it down. And, uh, and Bangalore became the high-tech capital of India, uh, in some measures, the high-tech capital of the world, uh, by being, by, by being, by making, turning a disadvantage of being uh, not able to ship anything out into an advantage of a place where clever people live uh, and sell their goods worldwide. But so it does, in that sense, both level the playing field, but also enable pinnacles of excellence. I told you 
I was earlier that keep that graph of China and India in your mind of the world in 1830. This is the world um, of mobile telephony last October. Just took a snapshot of what was the size of the various mobile phone you know, markets in the world. And um, this is the result. China is by far the world's largest market for mobile, as you would expect, India. By f and you see, the ratios are exactly the same as the world economy in 1830. Total domination by these countries. If you look further down the graph, did you know that there are more um, mobiles in Bangladesh than there are in Germany? More in Pakistan than Japan? A higher proportion of mobile penetration in Indonesia than there is in Japan um, or, um, or, uh, or Mexico. Uh, I mean, in other words, this is a technology, it's gone, it's happened, game's over. We have no advantage. We have no advantage uh, in, in the West. If you look at um, uh, internet use, slightly different. Uh, the US is still the second largest uh, internet market in the world. Um, India only, only number three. But we have got a bri the BRICS in, in, the, in the telephones, they were occupying four out of the top five places. Here, they're operate, offering four out of the top uh, six. <coughs> it runs China, US, India, Brazil, Japan, Russia. So, another way in which the BRICS are the dominant force in these two new technologies. And if you then think of it in terms of the emerging world uh, and the uh, developed world, uh, Asia is about 45% of the total world market uh, of internet users. Um, we're just that tiny cluster over on the right-hand side of the graph. What's it mean? Um, we have no lead, but there are peaks in Europe. There are things we can do in Europe that we can do very well. Um, and um, I think that we can, part of our future, our success is, is is, is using the things that we can do well uh, to sell to the world. The obvious issues at the bottom, how do we compete? Less obvious, what do we learn? The final of my four um, forces for change is debt. And, um, well, let's just have a look at the graphs because the story here, uh, I think, is, is pretty, um, pretty self-evident. Here's one. This is looking at public debt uh, in um, the world since, what, 95 to 12. Japan just whizzing up. But even, even you know, the UK, France, the US, all climbing on the right, bottom right-hand side of that screen, all whizzing up. So even before the recession, we were not really in getting getting a proper handle on our, on our debts. And if you add together all that, i.e. government debt, um, financial market debt, corporate debt, personal debt, mortgages, the whole caboodle, you get a graph like this. This is from work by McKinsey. It only goes through to 2010, I'm afraid. Uh, they haven't redone it, but it was just, they just added up all the debts, and you have the UK joining Japan at the top of this particular league of... Uh, League of Shame. Um, but look at something else. At the top of the graph, all the solid lines are the developed world. At the bottom are the bricks. And yes, I know China is lying about its debt levels. But, 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 but even, if it's, if, even if they were half as big again as they are, and I've seen estimates of 20, 30 percent, they're still lower than Germany. And they're growing, whereas Germany is growing on. Yeah, they're growing at 7%, whereas Germany's growing at uh, 2 if it's lucky. So, in other words, debt is a problem of our world. Uh, it's not a problem so much of the emerging world. What does it mean? Pretty self-evident, uh, but um, again, I think the, one of the things that we have to do within the entire developed world is just have cleverer government, smarter government, um, and actually there's a book out by Micklethwaite and Wooldridge on this in a week or two's time, reimagining how government might work. I've only just sort of seen the, seen the, the, the posters for it. Might, well, it's an era of how do, we, how, do we, how do we make government much better? It's not very good. 
How do we make it better? So that's the first story. These long forces pushing along globalization. What about the cycle? They interact because the cycle speeded up the process. If you uh, have um, us going you know, down by 4% in a year and China still going up by 8 my word, that swings the pace of change massively. So there was, <coughs> thanks to this cycle, a, a great leap forward by the, by the BRICS relative to the developed world. And you can see the different paths of growth between the developed world and the emerging world from this graph from the IMF World Economic Outlook. And the red line is the emerging world, the blue line is the our world, the developed world. Couple of things. One, note that the red line never dipped below the watermark during this crisis. There was net, 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 no uh, recession in the emerging world. Uh, there were bits of it, and bits kept on growing, but net, there was none. We had a humdinger of one. Net something else. Even before the crisis, the red line and the blue line were quite a way apart. Note something else, the projections. The red line and the blue line are quite a way apart. And if you look at, these are IMF projections for um, 2015, um, we have, you know, reasonable growth in uh, most of the major uh, Western economies projected. I May mean, not achieve it, but projected. But we have the fastest growing of the uh, developed world, the US is three, which is less than half the level of India, projected at 6.4. Now, they won't necessarily be right, these are to detail, but it makes the big point that this gap is still there, notwithstanding the reassessment of the emerging world, you know, hitting, hitting the buffers and not doing as well as it was doing, still growing faster than us. Finally, some graphs that I've derived out of the Goldman Sachs BRICS model which they developed in, I think, 2002. And it was Jim O'Neill who didn't actually do most of the work on it, but suddenly thought of the clever idea of calling it the BRICS, dreaming with the, with the BRICS. And of course, now we have BRICS summits and things. You know, it's, it's astonishing the power of an idea. Uh, astonishing the power of an idea. Um, well, it shows, as we'll see, China passing the US in 2027. I can't remember if it's July or August. I mean, you know, they, they don't mind the spurious precision of all this, but that's what the model says. Uh, India around 2050. I also want to show you a, a financial market graph of some projections they've done of how Wall Street uh, becomes a second to Shanghai and, uh, uh, and Hong Kong. Well, here we are in 2020. Now, here, remember, market exchange rates, not purchasing power parity, uh, the US still ahead. If you look, um, and then it goes Japan, Germany, UK, India, France, Russia, so that's, those are the projections. Go forward to 2030, and China at market exchange rates clearly pulling ahead. India up there to number three spot. Um, Russia still, and Brazil having passed Germany. So we've got already by 2030 the big change. And I suppose you might say the 2020s are the decade when the big flip, the big flip happens. And then just let's go forward to 2050. I mean, this becomes science fiction, but um, we have there China, by far the world's largest economy, and India snapping at the heels of the United States. Brazil and Russia, much, much bigger than Japan. This is the model. That raises questions about, you know, is the model right? And we'll come to some of those in a moment. But I thought to just show you one more graph which shows um, the Goldman projections for equity markets in 2030. And the, uh, the uh, blue bit, bluish bit on my side is developed markets. Uh, and the reddish orangey bit on the other side is emerging markets. So a world where Wall Street, which presently is 50% of global equity comp uh, market, market uh, uh, capitalization, is only a quarter and is dwarfed by uh, the, the equity markets in, in China. All this is almost it's beyond our ken. 
And this is at the extremes of what we might imagine. But then I say, would you have imagined 10 years ago that Tata would be the people who'd rescue Jaguar Land Rover, or I would be working for a former colonel in the KGB? Um, <laughs> just some questions which I'm going to put up, really, uh, as, as subjects for the rest of the day. Um, I think these north-south tensions within Europe will continue. Um, you know, they saved the euro temporarily. They haven't, you know, uh, but at such huge cost. I mean, the cost of squads of young, bright, wonderful southern Europeans coming to uh, Germany or indeed to Britain, cutting up salads uh, at Pret. I mean, you know, this isn't, this isn't a good solution. Um, I think Central and Europe, Eastern Europe, do prosper. Um, though they have legacy issues which they have not entirely solved, as I discovered in Slovenia. Um, I don't think we should diss Europe. I mean, we've got wonderful people here, wonderful, clever, thoughtful, intelligent people. But we have a very underperforming political system. Uh, and you would have, we can all have different views about which bits are underperforming. But uh, we, 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 do, we do good companies and bad politics. Now, I, I discuss. Um, uh, I think there are a lot of unresolved tensions. Some conclusions. Some conclusions and some questions, which my conclusions are really on this board. Um, I, I think that we have 10 years of decent global growth during which we can fix some of our problems. Um, I think that it is a troubling short-term output, but not on the medium. I mean, if we, if we play our hand of cards in, in Europe and, 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 and well in the next 10 years, we will inevitably lose power in the world, but it will not be in a catastrophic way. It'll be more like Japan light. Uh, you know, we, we will be comfortable, we will be less important, but we will manage our problems uh, reasonably well. And I, I do believe, and I believe passionately, that this rebalancing away from us is actually just. It, it is not, it is, it, is the, it is what should be. We have no right to have a much better standard of living than the rest of the world. Um, we have no, no, no God-given no, no God right. We have to earn it. And here are the questions. Um, is it too linear, my analysis? Yes, of course it is, far too linear. There'll be surprises which change everything. I think, can, how does China change from its, you know, its 8% its gallop to a 5% canter, uh, a 3% a, a trot, and then maybe, maybe a 2% walk? Very difficult to make that transition well. Um, Japan failed, um, and the various other things. How does India cope with being the most populous nation? And there'll be people who can answer those much better than I can. Um, can we cope with pressure on the environment? Um, and how will we deal with loss of leadership? How will we in the West cope with that? Um, it will happen. How do we cope? Enough questions there, I think, for moving us into questions now. And can I just say thank you very much. Thank you, Kai, for asking me to do this.